You're listening to Death of the Reader, Flex and Herds here for your Murder Mystery World Tour, and we are here at long last, back again with Brad Friedman of Our Sweet Mystery. Brad, it is so wonderful to have you back in our hallowed halls. I am so excited to be virtually down under with you two again. I have been waiting for this book for so long. I spoke with uh, Professor Satomi Saito about it. I've spoken about it with Ho Ling Wong, who's the translator. Been waiting and waiting for the Millhouse Murders by Yukuda Ayatsuji, the second novel in the Mansion Murder series. The 10th one, I think, has actually been announced as of a few months ago. Yeah, we've been sitting on nine since about 2012, but the uh, the Twin House Murders is supposedly Twin. M- making slow progress in Yukuto Ayatsuji's pages. Well, Flex, if you are tight like that with Ho Ling Wong, will you please send him a message from me? I love him dearly. I'm so grateful for what he's doing, and he's got to get on book three right away. <laughs> I, I much agree. I much agree. Yeah, we are talking chapters one to five. You two are solving this novel today. Take me through the summary of what you think is going on, because I want to let you know before we begin anything today, I was pretty confident I had solved this book before I opened its front. <laughs> I feel like that's almost too much of a too much of a hint there. Yeah, so to be clear, Brad and I have had no collaboration up until this point, but I'm excited to get into it because, as you say, the cover of the book has a big mask on it, which implies some things, especially when the mask looks like a specific person. And we never see the face that is underneath that mask. Oh, gosh, I wasn't going to go there at all. You what? Where are you going to go? See, I have this advantage over you, Herds. I happen to, you know, if you look at the map at the beginning, Uh that is coincidentally the spitting image of the map of my condo. Oh, really? (laughs) You know what? Complete with the three giant mill wheels. Yes. (laughs) See, with the mill wheels, although it's an older condo, one of the mill wheels doesn't work. But Uh I have, despite that, reenacted everything in the first five chapters, and I have come to the absolutely 100% correct conclusion that the killer is Mrs. Peacock in the North Pavilion with the candlestick. Ah. Sounds right. He's on the money. He's on the money. I need to know, how does this relate to your condo? Do you have a Mrs. Peacock and or candlesticks in your condo right now? Can we, can you tell us? (laughs) I do have candlesticks. And they're missing all their gold. (laughs) Oh, no. And they're missing. Yes, right. No, you know what? Uh, yes, I think we're heading toward mass talk. Um, this is, uh, you know, straight out of Inugami Curse. And that's my favorite of that series so far. And the mask figures very dominantly in that one as well. And of course, mm-hmm. it's not a red herring in certain ways. So that's why I'm with your herds on the mask. So yeah, we are covering two time periods in this novel. We've got 1985, where the crimes actually occurred, and 1986, where Shimada Kiyoshi has arrived to reinvestigate a year ago's happenings. The son of artist Issei Fujinuma, Kichi Fujinuma, has been keeping his father's art locked up in the mill house and only invites once four, now three friends each year on the 28th of September to look at the art, and that is the only time it is shown to the world anymore. In 1985, the housekeeper falls over the railing, one man is murdered and one man disappears, and then in 1986, Shimada Kiyoshi arrives, the storm rolls back in just as it did the year before, and it seems history is doomed to repeat itself. I mean, we even have a character with like a perfect a, a perfect memory, I think it's Oishi, who's like, Ah, it is raining just like that fateful night. It's it's great. I love it. I love the parallelism of the two versions. You know, like like in the first two chapters, he wakes up at exactly the same time, which of course reinforces the fact that it must be the same person. But we won't go there <laughs> quite this minute. Yeah, we will save that for the mystery section. Save that for the mystery part. But the but the but the parallels. I mean, yes, the storm coming in in exactly the same way. I think it thunders at exactly the same time. The people arrive at the same time. All of that. It's well rendered on the Mm. page and it makes it a a very quick read actually yeah and if you're not familiar with the mansion murder series one of the whole gimmicks is that it we're not following the detective even though shimata kiyoshi is back we're actually following the architecture of nakamura seiji 
who designed the Decagon and Blue Mansions in the previous book. Are you going to learn that he built all the houses in the Mansion series? Yeah, no, that's that's the gimmick. Oh, mm-hmm. God, I did not realize that. It's so cool. <laughs> it's like a comic book. I love okay. the same way that we reestablish this like weird, impossible design. There's like three giant mill rotors that are spinning in the nearby canal that are somehow powering the entire building, but also whisper silent. Yeah, like it's up in the mountains and the book even says this is a, a place that no sane person would want to live in. Like it's completely self-sufficient and isolated. It's not the kind of place that somebody social would live. And yet that's the focus of the story, a social event. And does it strike you as a really odd house in that it has a courtyard the size of a football field and then a little (laughs) tiny cluster of rooms on one corner, the northwest corner, I believe, that houses um, Kichi and his wife. And then in the southeast corner are the guest rooms. And it may take, you know, two mm-hmm. or three hours to go from one section to another, <laughs> but you get to look at beautiful paintings all yeah. the way. It seems like a waste of space, but interesting nonetheless. It's it's sort of fun having all of this characterization done for Nakamura, who is dead, cannot build any more houses. But we can discover as many houses of his as we like, which is, of course, the fun part. Well, certainly the mansion concept has been incorporated by many authors. Death in the House of Rain and the Death in the Crooked House. These are different authors, and they also incorporate that same idea of a house that's impossible to live in. One of the strangest ones in this novel to me is that we have like just one lift to get up to the master bedroom because Kichi Fujinima is uh, is wheelchair bound. So he can't get to most of his own house without assistance from at least two other people. And the lift is broken. Well, it is now broken, apparently. It is now broken, yes. The other issue that's come up is this whole concept of the missing painting and the idea of art that Issei is, is a very uh, distinguished artist, sort of the Amaius Crail, maybe, of Japanese crime fiction, as I refer to Five Little Pigs. But the painting that everyone wants to see is the Phantom Cluster, the last painting he painted before his death, except it's a painting in a completely different style from his other work. And everybody, all these um, people uh, want to see it. Uh, the friends who come each year want to see it and are, are really... Perhaps then we should examine the idea of them being friends, right? Like as we've covered, it's a house for an isolationist and the man of the house, Kichi, says, you know, I would I would call this off. I would call this whole event off if I didn't think that they would just come knocking anyway. There's like a letter that shows up that says, leave this house because it's like a ghost haunting the house or something. And Kichi immediately suspects those three friends. He's like, which one of them left the note here? Which one of them is out to get me? Yeah, and it's also interesting because it's not really presented as a mystery in the story, but we have all of these background deaths that have contextualized why everyone is so on edge. Like, Issei died 10 years ago. Kichi and Masaki and Masaki's girlfriend were in a car crash wherein the girlfriend died. And so you're sort of left to pick out as the reader which of these ones may be like the motivating piece and how those motivations play out. Yeah, it's it's interesting actually that Masaki's girlfriend dies in the in the car crash because the book tries to kind of obfuscate it. Even though Issei appears in the character list, Otto, the girlfriend, doesn't, which is interesting. Because she is fridged. Um <laughs> she is a fridged character. <laughs> the girlfriend does not appear, Masaki yep. does appear. But we're never quite clear what happened. Well, we're not clear yet what happened in that. We know that the car burst in flames. We're told that that's why Kichi wears the mask and has gloves on its hands. But we don't know what happened to Masaki. We do know one thing that happened to Masaki, which is that he stopped painting. Yeah, it's almost as though he was injured in the in the heart. Like, it's, it's, it's clear that everyone in that car crash was injured. It's just that Masaki was injured in a different way to everybody else, psychologically. I think the last, the last thing that I wanted to kind of cover before we threw over to the mystery section is the reason that Shimada Kiyoshi is here, which is that after what happened in the Dekagon house murders and the connection that he discovers with Nakamura Seiji, he's basically kind of gone on a bit of a pilgrimage to find out what weird thing happened to another one of his friends in another one of Nakamura Seiji's buildings. 
which is such an absurd setup. It's like kind of just having a go at the detective always shows up where the murder is trope. Is it going to be like Unbreakable where we find that there's actually this kind of rivalry between the dead architect and the live detective? That's that's kind of the vibe, right? We get a new villain every week who's done a murder, but then we have the <laughs> overarching villain, which is Seiji, who's built all these impossible contraptions in there murder houses. I suppose the, the the thing I want to leave us with before we throw over to the mystery section is that Uh-oh. there's, there's going to be a lot of points on offer here. I have oh, a God. smorgasbord of things I will give you points for. Give a spreadsheet. But they're all going to have to be very precise and figuring out what the Nakamura Seijiism is of this building is going to be one of them. Oh, goodness. Well, that'll be fun. Absolutely. You're listening to Death of the Reader, your murder mystery world tour here on 2SER 107.3. We are discussing the Millhouse murders by Yukido Ayatsuji, chapters 1 to 5, and we'll be back with more of that in just a second. You're listening to Death of the Reader, and I'm joined today by Dennis Altman, is an academic and writer who first came to attention to the publication of his book, Homosexual Oppression and Liberation, in 1972. Also, his book, Global Sex, has been translated into five languages. And Dennis, I must say, first of all, welcome to, to SER. It's wonderful to have you here. Thank you. And it's lovely to be, to be back, as I have been on 2SER probably decades ago before you were born. I, I would not be surprised. <laughs> we are talking about Death in the Sauna today, which is your debut crime fiction mm-hmm. novel. And it is a wonderful spoof of Agatha Christie set just after the turn of the millennium at a conference featuring AIDS research, wherein the main researcher dies just ahead of the conference in suspicious circumstances, and your broadcast sets about trying to unravel what happened to him or re-ravel what happened to him. Uh-huh. And it's not clear who's doing which, <laughs> which I thought was a great place to start. What about that particular game of who do we actually trust as our narrators enticed you most for this book? It's a really interesting way of thinking about it, because of course, there is a lot of quite deliberate reference to Agatha Christie in this book. And that's because I grew up with Agatha Christie. And when I was writing, I actually went back and reread a couple of her books, mainly to see how she did it. And I think the main thing I learned from Agatha Christie is to be sparse. Yeah. Most modern murder stories tend to be far too long. And you lose track of who's doing what. You don't need to know long backstories of minor characters. As you say, almost anybody in the book could have done almost anything. It's so interesting that you say that you feel it's sparse because I think to some extent, just as a sort of adjectival disagreement, I think that what's actually quite impressive in this book is the way that you've managed to fit so much density in, particularly through the way that you use so many different narrators in the book, as I was mentioning, which is a little atypical in the crime fiction sense because we're often still to this day dealing with the perspective, the Watson archetype. Why jump between all of these different people? Well, I th- of course, one of the differences is there isn't a single professional detective. There's yeah. no Poirot. There's no Miss mm-hmm. Mar- Um, And so, in a sense, a number of the characters play a double role. They Mm. could be the villain or they could, in fact, be the detectives. Uh, Look, I don't think this was thought through that consciously. Um, I I should explain, the book began as a lockdown game, going for a walk with a friend of mine to whom the book is dedicated, and I think we invented the story, and as we did, we invented the characters. I then went away and started writing it, and the characters took on different lives of their own, and I think you're pointing to something that... I guess I hadn't done deliberately, but yes, it's true. I can think of at least three characters whose position is sufficiently ambiguous that, yes, in the end, one of them could well have been the murderer. I I think it's also very fun because of the way that it's so clear that everyone is omitting details when they are narrating. For example, the the first one that I spotted in the book is when we arrive at Pomfrey's house and the doctor is already there when he was said over the phone to be arriving a few minutes after the people who were seeing from their perspective at that moment. And it's immediately a moment where I, as a murder mystery reader, go, hang on a second. (laughs) 
Alejandro should not be here yet. Of course, there have to be a large number of possibilities. Yeah. And one, one, of the, one of the real problems when you write this sort of book mm. is you have to actually, it has to actually be feasible that four or five people could be responsible. Yeah. And in fact, there are in most cases pretty good reasons why the case you give, and I don't want to say too much about it, but there is actually a pretty simple reason why Alejandro uh, shows up early in the house. Um, and, and over time, I think that becomes clear. Yeah. How clear, I'm not sure I want to say on air. <laughs> the, the other thing that's interesting about that is, I guess, in the queer experience that you talk about in the book, there is so much omission in the way that people have this second part of their lives. You know, Pomfrey is found dead in a gay sauna when he's married to a woman, and uh, there's all sorts of people living these alternate stories which sort of feels to be very congruous to the mystery experience of all of these little things you don't know going on in the background. But isn't that always true? I mean, is it possible to write a murder story in which you know everything? Mm. Because if you knew everything, there wouldn't be a story. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, so we have to, you have to give the, 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 the uh, reader a certain leeway to guess and to imagine. There was also the question of... How much surveillance was around? And I actually had to do a certain amount of research. Now, 20 years ago, pretty well anybody could walk into a sauna. If you now go into a gay sauna in most Western countries, you have to produce photo ID. Now, that immediately would restrict the possibilities that are available for a murderer. I, I wanted to talk about the sense of place in the book because I love the way that so many of the characters that are sort of presented as isolated in their friendship circle live on a cul-de-sac. I don't know if you did that on purpose, but I thought that was a beautiful little detail. The way that the conference is described as being at a center with the charm of a mall, I thought was wonderful. And you just have all of these very clear bits where the location is serving the story so well. What did, what did that come from? There are certain things I remember extremely well. There's a scene in a rather seedy used book and stamp show yeah. at Charing Cross. And anyone who's listening who's been to London can probably picture that. Now, I have actually been there. And, I, you know, I will admit I'm old, I'm geeky, I collect stamps. <laughs> so I've actually been to that. That stamp show. But you know, there are other bits in London, I will have to admit, I have never been to. And such is the miracle of Google <laughs> that you can, of course, now go onto a street. You can literally walk down a street in London that you have never been on. You've taken a very tried and true murder mystery trope of having your main character be the person who is dead, at least in my mind. I felt like Pomfrey is really the character around which the story resolves and we find out so much about his character to tell everyone else's. How did you find writing a character who wasn't there to speak for himself most of the time? That's really interesting. I, I certainly wouldn't have thought of him like that. I don't think I liked him very much. <laughs> that, that much was somewhat apparent. Yes, I don't think I liked him very much. In fact, I didn't like a number of them very much. Um, I got asked in one interview who was my favourite character and I paused and I said, well, you know, I think it might be easier for me to tell you who were my least favourite characters <laughs> and my least favourite characters are actually the three guys who jockey for position. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, the, the stakes are quite high. I mean, these are guys for whom a Nobel Prize, a life peerage, very considerable sums of money. They're all possible outcomes. You you seem surprised by my assertion that Pomfrey might be the main character of the story. So who would you say, Noel? I don't know that there are that there is a main character. Interesting. I I, I suppose that Noel and Sylvie, as the two people mm. who basically will uncover what happened, are perhaps the main characters. Um, you know, and if we went back to Agatha Christie. Um, I would hate to think of them as, you know, he, she had those, that terrible brother and sister duet, Thomas and Tuppence. Yeah. I hope very much Noel and, and Sylvia, not Thomas and Tuppence, <laughs> but, but maybe they play that role a bit. You know, one of the things I have learned from my good friend Christos Cholkas is that 
you shouldn't make your characters too nice. Mm. And one of Christos's great secrets, because he is an absolutely lovely, warm, adorable man, and he creates horrible characters. And I think I had that in the back of my mind. You don't have to make your characters, particularly in a murder story, people you like. You mm. have to make them people you might find interesting. They're not necessarily the people you want to go out to dinner with. Well, Dennis, it has been wonderful speaking with you here on the show. I thank you so much much for joining us here on 2SER. It's been great. Thank you. Dennis Altman is the author of Death in the Sauna. We will have links up on the website if you want to find more about that. You're listening to Death of the Reader, your murder mystery world tour here on 2SER 107.3. More to come. Stick around. You're listening to Death of the Reader, Flex and Herds, and Brad Friedman from Our Sweet Mystery here discussing Yukuro Ayatsuji's second mansion murder novel, The Mill House Murders. Brad and Herds are the ones solving this novel. And I made a bold claim at the start of this episode. You'll notice, if you've read along with us, that kind of the murders haven't entirely happened up to the point where we are in the book. Right, we're not there yet. We've seen the aftermath of one murder from the past, and apparently there's a locked room in here somewhere, but I haven't seen that happen. I assume that the present murder is going to be a locked room one, but, like, you have you have cut us off from our supply of locked room murders. What's what's What gives? I have cut you off. And, and yet, Brad boldly said that there was something in the parallelism that was uh, that was leading him in a certain direction. So I'm a I'm a Agatha Christie nut. So I pay very close attention to proper nouns. So that's what I've been doing. I have these four pages of notes here where I put the action and the potential clues, and I just keep pulling one quote after another, which suggests that they're not clarifying who anybody is from the Mm -hmm. beginning to the end, from the opening where they only refer to people as the handsome man and the ruddy man and, and the, and the man in the wheelchair, they don't say their names. And then when we go, we go back and forth between the first person present tense and the third person past tense, sort of from the point of view of the man in the wheelchair. And there's only one time And that is in the past, at one point in the later chapter that we've read, where they kind of say directly that the man is Ichi. Nothing had changed. At least nothing appeared to have changed. However, I knew this house had undergone a great transformation. It was, of course, all because of what happened last year. A man and a woman had died and another man disappeared. But they don't say who. Who's the man who disappeared? Are you suggesting to me, Brad Friedman, that a person wearing a mask in a mystery novel may not be who they seem? <laughs> Maybe I've overstepped. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about, Brad, but but yeah, I'm, I'm going to back Brad on this. I'm going to call out specifically when a detective, Shimada Kiyoshi, shows up, he says twice to the man in the wheelchair, Ah, oh, Fujinuma, I presume, and you are Kiichi, aren't you? effectively. And both times the man in the wheelchair does not answer. There is clearly a switch between the past and the present between who is wearing the mask in both timelines. Here's a couple of catches. And this is clearly what Yukido Aetsuji is throwing at you explicitly. What are the catches? I'm well, scared. The prologue, for example, gives us a body burned in an incinerator. And there is a finger found outside that is clearly identified as Masaki Shingo's. But it's not in the incinerator and is clearly left as a clue to be found. It is clearly left as a clue. However, if you are saying that he has taken Kichi's place and nobody has observed that the current Fujinuma Kichi is missing a finger, c- come on. Gloves, Love, baby. White gloves. With a fake finger in With there. With a fake finger? Yes. The, the two things that were damaged in the car crash were Kiichi's face and his hands. So we just hide his face in his hands. That's not Goodness difficult. Goodness me. You're starting to make it seem like this this little puzzle of who is who is 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 trivially easy. I'm going to lay out the motivation while we're here because I, I think I can have a stab at it. As we mentioned, the car crash took the life of one person, the face and hands of, of another, and nothing physically from the third because it took his heart. Masaki Shingo is is the killer. He blames Kiichi for the death of his wife in the car crash and furthermore sees Yurie as a path to redemption. I'm going to say that the locked room in the present is going to have to do with either A, mask shenanigans of misidentifying people, 
or two, the fact like, oh no, the lift's broken. I couldn't possibly walk up all those stairs in this wheelchair that I am bound to. And then he walks up the stairs because he's masaki and he's fine. Well, there's also a line in there in the present tense, in the first person perspective of the man in the wheelchair. It is observed that Yurie is the only person that our narrator has ever loved. So what does that do to your motivation? No, I have a well, feeling there's a there's something romantic between Masaki and Yure. I believe that. There's all kinds of things. She she treats the man in the mask as if she really cares for him, but yes. she never calls him Kichi. Mm-hmm. Ever. She yeah. knows who he is. The the whole thing about the piano and how Masaki played the piano for her and taught her how to play. And yep. she says to a, a sentence later, on, I would never be able to play the piano for her like that. Not like Masaki Shingo had. Of course he couldn't, because if he played it like Masaki Shingo had, everyone would know he was Masaki Shingo. Well, also he'd have had a, a tenth finger, presumably. The, the song that she plays, The Girl with the Flaxen Hair, is like all about a girl that you want, but you don't want to know if... They want you, like, you don't want to actually be with their, like, unobtainable in their beauty, which is clearly Masuki Shingo being like, I, I don't know if I can have you, Yurie, because of all of this stuff that I've done. But yeah, I'm, I'm 100% with you that Yurie is, like, in on, in on the joke, as it were. There's also um, the missing priest. And uh, yes. the narrator says the greatest cause of my anxiety was, of course, the man who had disappeared from that room. Mm-hmm. Was he dead or still alive? If he was alive, where was he hiding? Why does he want to find that man? Because that man knows something too. Whether that man turns out shock ending to be Masaki himself or whether the priest knows about the switcheroo and has run away to protect himself, something's going on with that. And I have a feeling that's going to come back to haunt us when we deal with whatever present day murder there is. I thought he might be hiding in the walls, but... (laughs) I guess my question is then... It sounds like you think that Fujinu Makichi is the one who is incinerated at the start of the story. Very possibly likely, yes. I would believe it. By Masaki as vengeance for killing his fiance so that he could take on his life and be closer to the father who he who he idolized mm-hmm. than Kichi, because Kichi's not a painter. You think that the priest, Kojin, is like still in the walls or ran away and never told anyone anything about what he knew? Like, how how are we keeping this man silent? Before we jumped in here, I would have said he was hiding in the walls in some kind of secret passage. For a whole year? Hurts. Is the priest dead? Is the priest burned? And it's Kichi who's on the run? Oh, uh, maybe, maybe. Where is the body in the walls, though? Is there any clue possibly indicating where the body is located in the walls? There is. Look into Flex's eyes. There is a clue. There's a clue. It's the locked room. I'm just very uncomfortable suggesting there's a secret passage unless there's some there can be- clue to it because I do believe that they really follow the rules. Here's my counter to you, Brad. Nakamura Seiji is your excuse to do weird things yes. with a house. I am telling you. <laughs> so I'm suggesting that no matter who is in that under that mask, the other person or the person who is in the incinerator is believed to have been killed in mysterious ways. Also, and there are suspects to that. Let, lest we forget there is a missing painting. Well, there is my final question for this week. Where and what is the phantom cluster? Oh, yes, God. yes. And <laughs> I'm so tempted to say something, but I know this is a family podcast, so I'm going to leave it there. Okay, you can let us know after we uh, disappear. <laughs> Well, before we wrap up, I will I will let you know next week on the show, the things that I need from you is I need to know what happened to Masaki Shingo in that car crash. I need to know which body is where and why. I need to know the Nakamura Seijiism of this building. I need to know five of the clues. Five? At least. And last of all, I need herds. You to decide whether these points are going to you or to the away team. Oh, come on. Can't we split them in half? <laughs> no half points on this show, my friend. No, but like, look, I'm just, we can split them up. We can be fair about this. I don't want to deprive Brad entirely. We'll see. Well, Brad, Herds, best of luck with Yukuro Ayatsuji's The Mill House Murders. We're talking one to five, but next week on the show, 
We are going chapters 6 to 11. Yes, Basically the whole thing. The whole thing, yeah. Gotta get our locked room mystery. The chapters do get a bit long towards the end. Ah, oh, crap. <laughs> they gotta explain everything. Yeah, they have to explain everything. Right, I'm gonna need a, a map of your condo um, just to compare with the notes we get in the book. Well, you already have one apparently, Hood. It's you know what, the you're right. page of the book. It's fabulous. Yeah, yeah. Okay, fair enough. I'll show you, I'll show you where the cat's. Sleep. Where's your secret passage, Brad? Is that is that where you hide the cat? Little did we know that Brad's condo was designed by Nakamura Seiji. That sounds yes. right. Yes, it was. You could set a book there. Well, you're listening to Death of the Reader, your murder mystery world tour. We will be back with chapters 6 to 11 next week on the show. Thank you both for joining me here for Yukido Hayatsuji's second mansion murder novel. See you next week. Yeah, see you next time. You're listening to 2SER 107.3, and we are out of here. <laughs>